People love gossip, especially if it involves sex and scandal. Uh, I think even in 2015, a young teenager getting pregnant still gets the tongues wagging. Mary, uh, an engaged to be married teenager, uh, but a teenager who had utterly respected God's teaching that his wonderful gift of sexual intimacy is solely for within marriage. Uh, But an angel appears to her and says, you're pregnant. Uh, You're pregnant despite the fact that you and Joseph have been entirely honourable. And get this, uh, this baby is no ordinary baby. He is God himself. Well, who's going to believe this? I wonder what Mary thought. Would Joseph believe this? Well, Joseph didn't. Uh, We know from Matthew's Gospel that Joseph didn't uh, before an angel, uh, another angel, had to intervene. Uh, Will my parents believe this? Will my family believe this? Will my village believe this? Well, not a chance, really, is there? Uh, And and so now what? Uh, This angel has appeared to me and said that I am favoured by God. Uh, This angel has told me not to fear. I wonder how Mary felt the morning after that meeting with the angel. Did she think, did this really happen? Uh, was Was it a dream? This is a nightmare. Perhaps she hoped it really was a nightmare. And, and so what exactly was she supposed to do now? Well, the angel's final words to Mary are recorded in verse 36. Uh, and verse 39 tells us exactly what she did do next. Uh, you can see my headings, my first heading this morning, evidence and encouragement Uh, The angel said to Mary, verse 36, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Uh, Elizabeth was a relative much older than Mary. Uh, Luke tells us earlier in the chapter that Elizabeth and her husband Zechariah were very old and that Elizabeth was unable to have children. So, Mary, the angel said, uh, God has done the miracle of all time in you. Uh, He's done what everyone is going to say to you is impossible. But actually, Mary... I need you to know this is not the only miracle that he's done at this particular point in time. He's also done a miracle. He's also done the impossible with your relative Elizabeth, who is a very old lady. She is unable to have children. And yet, says the angel to Mary, as we speak, she is six months pregnant. And I think the implication of verse 36, perhaps you'd have a look at it, I think the, verse, the implication of verse 36 is pretty much, uh, so why don't you go and check this out, Mary? Because, verse 37, you need to be assured that no word from God will ever fail. Uh, what God says always happens, Mary, but why don't you go and check that out? And so doesn't that explain the word hurried in verse 39? At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Why did she hurry? Well, she hurried to check out, to make sense of the angel's message. But I think the real surprise is what he said next. And I think this is utterly surprising. Let's just walk through this together uh, and see if you can decide what you would expect to be said next. So Mary goes to see Elizabeth. She treks down there. 
Uh, She's heard the angel's message. Uh, She's trekked for days and days and days from Nazareth up in the north down to the hill country of Judea in the south. Uh, She knocks on the door of Elizabeth. She goes in. They, 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 They hug each other. And Mary says, hello, Elizabeth. And she looks down and she sees that Elizabeth is, is, is she's got a six month, six month bulge there. What are the next words that are going to be said? Well, surely, with my reading anyway, surely we expect the next words to be said are, Elizabeth, you are pregnant. But instead, the first words are completely the other way round. The first words said are, Elizabeth is the one who speaks, not Mary. And Elizabeth says to Mary, Mary, you are pregnant with the Messiah. Verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. And why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Isn't that unexpected? We expect Mary to be the first to speak, to talk about the angel and say, I've come to see whether you really are pregnant. But actually, (laughs) actually, Mary isn't the one who speaks. Before Mary is able to say anything, what happens Before Mary is able to say anything, God's Holy Spirit miraculously comes upon John, the unborn baby in the womb. God's Holy Spirit miraculously comes upon Elizabeth. And the Spirit gives to Elizabeth unbelievable information. And the Spirit gives to Elizabeth the ability to believe this unbelievable information. And Elizabeth is able to say, without Mary first saying anything of what's happened with the angel, Elizabeth is able to say without Elizabeth... Elizabeth is able to say without Mary saying a word, Mary, I know! Mary, I know everything without you saying anything. And Mary, at this moment, you are the most favoured woman ever. Now... How would Mary have felt at this moment, given how we imagine she felt the day after the angel's message in Nazareth with all her fears? What had she just received? Well, I've given the game away with my first heading. God had given her, in the most marvellous way, evidence and encouragement. Uh, The angel had said to Mary... The impossible has happened to Elizabeth. Go and check it out. The angel had said, and the impossible will happen to you. And now completely independently, Elizabeth is now saying to Mary, yes, Mary, this really is happening. The impossible is happening to both of us. The impossible is happening to you too. Evidence and encouragement. We sometimes doubt the events of the gospel. Did these things really happen? Uh, We sometimes doubt the message of the gospel. God can forgive even me. God has a purpose even for me. God is in control despite the chaos. God is good despite the horrendous things that happen. It is worth giving up everything to follow Jesus. Faith does sometimes feel like a bit of a blind leap in the dark. But as we read of these events in the Bible, as especially at this time of year, we read of the detailed prophecies written hundreds of years before Jesus was born and then them actually becoming true. As we see the Bible speaking of these things and actually uh, actually making sense of our lives... As we see God acting in our lives in a way that he says he will. As we have good people around us encouraging us to see the truth of God's word. What are we receiving from God? We are receiving too, aren't we? We are receiving evidence and encouragement. God gives us these things too, even in 2015. 
My first heading, evidence and encouragement. Uh, Secondly, call to a purpose. Uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah, they had been praying for a baby for years and years and years and years. Why did God answer that prayer? Why did he? Uh, Was it because he was kind and compassionate and loves to give his people good things? Well, we're told throughout the Bible that he's kind and compassionate and loves to give his people good things. uh, And giving them a son is consistent with that. But there's rather more to it than that, isn't there? Uh, Zechariah was told that their son, who was to be called John, who later would become known as John the Baptist, uh, was to be someone who would prepare the way for the Lord. Uh, We saw that last week or the week before, that he would be the, the voice in the wilderness, crying out, prepare the way for the Lord. He would be Jesus's forerunner. Uh, When you go to a concert uh, and there's a big name on stage, sometimes there is a a warm-up act. John the Baptist was Jesus' warm-up act. Uh, He laid the foundations so that Jesus' message would be more easily heard and understood. Uh, And even in these few verses, even in the sixth month of his unborn life, we can't really get our mind around this, even in the sixth month of his unborn life, remarkably, miraculously, the Holy Spirit leaps into his mum's womb, and verse 44, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, Mary, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Even before he was born, the unborn John was acting as a warm-up act to the unborn Jesus. Why did God answer Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayer for a child? There were just so many reasons, aren't there? Was it to bless them? Yes, of course it was to bless them, but it was far more than that. Was it to bless Mary so that she could see that God had done a miracle for Elizabeth, so she could be confident that he would do what he'd said he'd do and do a miracle in her. Yes, and far more than that. Was it to make Jesus' job easier in warming up the crowd, in raising the spiritual temperature of Israel at that time? Yes, and probably more than that too. Why did God answer that prayer? Well, as we know from the rest of the Bible, it's all part of God's fantastic purposes to bring many hundreds of millions, if not billions of people into his kingdom who will one day enjoy eternity in the presence of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And it's extraordinary, isn't it, just to state the obvious, it is extraordinary that 2,000 years after this event, a tiny church in a tiny village in North Staffordshire is marvelling at our wonderful God because of a little kick that John gave his mum before he was even born. Extraordinary. Sarah and I were driving up from Cornwall a couple of weeks ago, uh, and there was quite an odd uh, programme on the radio we were listening to. It was about parenting. Um, and this programme and, and program interviewed a lady... Uh, And this lady uh, hadn't wanted to be pregnant because she hated children. And so then she had two children. uh, And after she'd had these children, she decided that, yes, she really did hate children. So she abandoned them. And then she talked at great length about how life was so much better now. Uh, because she had so much more time to do with her life what she wanted to do with her life and how how marvellous that was. And there was another interview with with a guy uh, and he was married, uh, or he's with someone anyway, um, who couldn't have children. So he left that person and went with someone else and she couldn't have children either. Uh, And so he just described at great length, and this went on for minutes and minutes and minutes, describing how unfulfilled he felt because because he didn't have children to fulfill them, to to, to fulfill him. Now, now obviously, we didn't 
know the full story. And, you know, sometimes TV programmes and radio programmes have got their own agenda and they can twist things quite effectively. But on the basis of what we heard, Sarah and I just sat next to each other in this car listening to this with our mouths open at the apparent utter selfishness of these two people. And they were communicating to us and communicating to the whole world on Radio 4. They were communicating to us that, that the whole point of living was to be self-fulfilled. And in the case of the lady, children got in the way of her self-fulfillment and so they had to go. And in the case of the guy, his whole purpose in wanting children was to benefit himself and benefit his own needs. Elizabeth called to be the mum of John the Baptist. Mary called to be the mum of the Lord Jesus. How utterly different their outlook was. Mary, gosh, how, how, how hard it must have been for her. I can't get over how hard it was. Uh, Mary, the pregnant teenager. Uh, Mary, the one we know Joseph will try and dump. Mary, the one who the people in her village would not believe. Uh, Mary, the one who, will, who from this year forward would always be known as the one who was a bit loose. Uh, Mary, the one that no wife in Nazareth would want to leave their husband alone with. This is what Mary's outlook was. And yet, verse 38, and this is so crucial, verse 38, how does Mary describe herself? Verse 38, she says, I am the Lord's servant. Verse 36, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. I am the most privileged of women, says Mary, because God is going to use insignificant me to serve. To bring into being someone who will change everything. Hence my title, called for a purpose. Uh, Elizabeth had been given her pregnancy for a purpose. Mary had been given her pregnancy for a purpose, a purpose much, much, much wider than herself. Why does God call us into relationship with him? We are saved for a purpose. We are saved to serve God. And I don't mind admitting, I've been having a, a bit of a panic attack over the last uh, few days as I've been looking at this, because I've just been wondering whether my preaching and my teaching has been as clear as it might have been on this particular point. We are saved by God not to make us feel better about ourselves, to make us feel more secure, to make us feel more loved. We are saved to serve. And doesn't that just fit in with the whole gospel message? What is the gospel message? The gospel message is that God loves us, but naturally we don't love him. We don't want to serve him. We want to serve ourselves. That will end in disaster, and so God has sent Jesus. He lives the perfect life of service. He died the death on the cross the life of non-service deserves. If I repent, if I turn, if I trust in the cross, on the cross I am credited with his life of service. On the cross he suffers the consequences of my self-serving life. I am now free. What am I now free to do? I am now free to serve. The reason I am saved is not primarily so I can feel secure and loved and fulfilled. No, the reason that God, the primary reason God saves us is so that we can serve him. Why is that so wonderful? Because that's how I was created. That's what I was created to do. That is the intention of my life by my creator. 
Do, 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 do you see the subtle difference in emphasis? Parenthood, of course it brings fulfilment and joy and all the rest of it. But the primary reason for parenthood is for children. It isn't for self-fulfilment. So the primary purpose for salvation is for God. It's for magnifying him, for glorifying him, for worshipping him, for living for him. It isn't about me and my self-fulfilment. Now, why is that such good news? Because it means that if you are a Christian, you have been chosen for a purpose. Your life has purpose. Somehow, God has plans to use even me for his grand cosmic purposes. Somehow, God has plans even for you to build his glorious kingdom. And the inevitable result of that, my last heading, is blessing and joy. When God gets hold of us, when God keeps encouraging us by giving us evidence, by giving us good people around us to encourage us, uh, when we see that we have been called for a purpose, when we get a glimpse of our place in God's grand cosmic plans what is the inevitable result of that well what was the result for elizabeth and mary what are the words that just saturate this tiny paragraph we have been reading well i've given the game away again with that with my headings blessing and joy just look with me verse 41 just look out for the words of blessing and joy and they are every other word almost Verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will hear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is the one who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. Mary and Elizabeth, two women who would have been heavily looked down upon in their society. Elizabeth, the old woman who couldn't have children. Mary, the unmarried girl who was pregnant, and both of them women, in a culture that favoured men. Where were they? Nazareth. Where was Nazareth? Nazareth was the back of beyond. The hill country of Judea, that was a desolate place. And both Mary and Elizabeth exemplify the way that God works. God, very simply, and we see it from beginning to end of our Bibles, God is in the business of not taking superheroes. God is in the business of taking very, very ordinary people. People who the rest of the world may find very unimpressive indeed. People like me. People like you. And he puts them in very ordinary places. Nazareth, hill country of Judea, even places like Hanford and Stoke-on-Trent. He puts us in very ordinary places. He puts us in challenging situations. He puts us in challenging families. And he says to us, as he says to Mary, listen to my word, obey my word, trust my word. And we see through Luke here, he says to us, I will give you all the evidence you need. I will give you all the encouragement you need. For I have called you for a purpose, a purpose than you will ever realise this side of heaven. I've called you to serve me. And in serving me, you will find that you are the most blessed people on the planet. You are the most joyful people on the planet. Because I've called you.